But just to give you kind of a brief outline, uh, to date we have Stata, Ado files, and macros. We have an SPSS macro and R functions developed to implement this new procedure. So today I'm going to walk through an example in Stata, but in your handouts, I've walked through the exact same two examples through Stata, SPSS, and R. So Stata is not your favorite, I apologize, um, but you do have the resources there and feel free to ask me or email or contact me if you have questions about those other software packages. So I want to start first with an example of the correlated effects case. So this is the case where you've got the correlated epsilons. So I'm going to use an example of some, um, a meta-analysis that I worked on looking at the effectiveness of substance abuse treatment programs for adolescents with drug use disorders. Now please note the disclaimer at the bottom and it's in all the output. I've actually manipulated this data to come out certain ways, so do not cite the actual results here. <laughs> Um, so don't talk about this substantively, but um, it started from our actual original data. Um, and so in this meta-analysis, we've got standardized mean difference effect sizes that were measured at post-test representing differences in any kind of drug use outcome between kids in a treatment condition versus some comparison condition. And so in this example, all of the effect sizes are coded so that positive values indicate the treatment kids did better. So they may have been using drugs less, or they were abstaining more, so on and so forth. Um, so in this example, let's say you have 172 effect sizes coming from 39 different studies. So an average of about four and a half effect sizes per study. Um, and so this is actually pretty common in this literature because a lot of studies will report multiple drug use outcomes. So they may have an alcohol use outcome, a marijuana use outcome, a mixed alcohol and marijuana use outcome. And they even, you know, within drug, they may have multiple measures. So you could have how many times in the last week have you used alcohol? How many times in the last week have you drunk, drank alcohol to drunkenness? How many times have you binge, um, engaged in binge drinking and so on? So it's very common in this literature to have multiple effect sizes per study. So the first thing that you want to do, say you've coded all of your data and you've got multiple effect sizes um, for each of your studies and you're using Stata for your meta-analysis work, um, is you will want to install the ADU file from the SSC archive. So for Stata users, this um, shouldn't be um, foreign. So you would just type SSC install Robu meta. So Robu meta is the name of the command. And so if you were to type that into the Stata command editor, you would then have this macro on your computer. And so once you have downloaded that, you can then type help Robu meta and you'll pull up the help file for the macro. So of course, I would always say the first thing you ever want to do before you use a new, um, use a new function in a software is read the help file. Um, so the first couple of pages of your handout, just because I know my students still do not do that when I tell them this, um, I've given you a copy of the help file. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so read through that carefully, um, and so this looks like, you know, your standard state of help file. Um, so just to walk through it a little bit, um, it's going to be in your kind of standard state of syntax. So you'll call the command Robu meta. You'll feed it your dependent variable, which in this case will be a variable for your effect size. Um, in the meta regression framework, you're going to feed it your independent variables or the covariates or moderators of interest. Um, just like any other state of command, uh, the Robu meta command is ifable and inable, so those are available to you. And then you'll have to specify some options. Um, so one, you'll have to have a variable indicating a study ID, which makes sense, right? So you're going to have a data set at the effect size level, so you'll need a study identifier. Um, you'll have to specify a weight type. I'll come back to that in, as we walk through the example. Uh, you'll have to have a variance variable. So the variance of your effect size estimate will have to be in your data set. Uh, the U weights is just an option if you wanted to specify your own user weights. I won't talk about that today. And then the row value. So as Beth mentioned earlier, in the correlated effects case, the row comes in um, in a couple different points. And so here, the way that we've got it programmed is the row is going to affect your tau squared estimate. Um, we're using the conservative approach in the multiplier. Um, so I won't go through it any further, but you can look um, through that carefully once you start using this and playing around with it. 
Um, the last thing I do want to point out, though, in case I forget when I'm walking through the example, is at the end of the help file, you will notice that, there, that Stata will store some scalars and macros and matrices that may be of use if you're doing some programming. So just to point that out there, I find that very useful. Okay, so let's go back to our example of the adolescent substance abuse uh, treatment meta-analysis. So let's say that um, you know, we have this, these data with 172 effect sizes, and let's say you've got four moderators of interest that you've specified a priori to be potentially important in affecting treatment effectiveness. Um, so let's say we have four moderators, two which vary within and between studies, and then two which only vary between studies. So as Beth mentioned, we really have to think about carefully our data, how our covariates are set up, how they vary. Um, so in this case, we've got um, two variables, and this might actually be easier to see in your handout. So I've got a log file printed. If, if it looks a little fuzzy up here, you might want to just follow along on your handout. Um, but if you were to look at the descriptive statistics there, we've got two indicators. So the first, the ALK variable, is a dummy indicator for whether or not the effect size was for an alcohol use outcome. Okay? And so as you can imagine, that variable is going to vary within as well as between studies because some studies are going to have alcohol and mixed alcohol and drug abuse outcomes, whereas some studies may have all marijuana outcomes, some may have all alcohol outcomes. So we know that that varies within and between studies. The same with this DV weeks variable. So this is actually a measure of the time frame of the outcome variable in weeks. So how often have you used alcohol in the past one week, in the past two weeks, the past four weeks, um, so on and so forth. So both of those covariates vary within and between studies. We've also got two covariates that only vary between studies, and so these are kind of sample level characteristics. So one is the gender composition of the sample, so how many, the percentage of boys in the sample. So that's only going to vary across studies. And then we also have a dummy indicator for whether the participant sample came from a prior level of treatment, so whether they were referred, referred from prior treatment um, facilities. So those bottom two only vary between studies. Um, so if you walk through your output here, and I'm sorry, I should have labeled, um, numbered the pages. Um, so on page two of the log file here, you can see that after you've installed the Robu meta command, the next thing we want to do, because we've got variables that, fit, that vary within and between studies, we need to create these study level mean values of the variable as well as the group mean centered values of the variables, right? So what Beth was talking about. Um, and so on line 18 of that code, there's a quick for loop syntax that you could use to plug in any of the variables you have that vary within and between studies. Um, and what that's doing then is creating a new variable um, for the ALK and DV weeks that's equal to the study level mean. Okay, it'll be M underscore ALK, M underscore DV weeks. So the study level mean, so that's going to measure our between effects. Um, between effect. And then it'll create a second variable that's the study level mean centered value of that variable. And so I've indicated that using the center command, which you can also download, which will automatically create a mean centered value of the variable. So if it's a little confusing, go home and play with it. Um, but you've got the syntax there, and it's quite easy to then just plug in the two variables or three or four, or however many you have. Okay, so, um, so let's say we've you know, set up our data. First thing we may want to do is estimate just an overall mean effect size. Um, so the Robu meta command is set up in a meta regression framework, so to estimate just your overall mean effect size with a robust confidence interval, you can just run an intercept only model uh, in the meta regression framework. Um, so here, you can see the kind of syntax of the command. You type in Robu meta. So we've got a variable called effect size measuring our outcome. Since we're doing an intercept only model, oh, I lost. Uh, we're not going to ind indicate any independent variables, but we do have to specify a few things. So your study ID, your weight type, in the correlated effects case, that will be random. 
and our variance here, you'll feed it your variance variable, and then a row value, let's say for some reason we're assuming um, that we've got some prior knowledge of, of a correlation of around 0 0.80. Um, so here, in this intercept only model, uh, in kind of standard state output, um, you can see the coefficient here, so the 0.23 would be your overall mean, and here is your robust confidence interval from 0.11 to 0.36. So overall, that's giving us a positive treatment effect, indicating that the kids in the treatment program are showing better outcomes, so they have less substance use after treatment. Now, a few things I want to point out here that will be a little bit different than kind of your standard meta-regression framework, kind of in case you forgot you were in the correlated effects case, um, this would remind you. Um, so it gives you the uh, number of level one units, so in this case, the number of effect sizes, so 172, uh, the number of level two units, which is your number of studies, and then that, you know, the number of studies ranges from one to 18 per study. The other thing I want to point out, which Beth kind of casually mentioned, but it's something that you should definitely be aware of, is that the t-test degrees of freedom is based on, the no, it's equal to the number of studies minus the number of parameters estimated. So the t-test degrees of freedom are based on the number of studies minus the number of parameters estimated. So what does this mean? So it means that if you have a thousand effect sizes coming from 20 studies, you don't have a lot of degrees of freedom just because you have 1,000 effect sizes. Your degrees of freedom are now based on those 20 studies, and so that's something to keep in mind, especially as you add covariates. You know, the more covariates you have in your meta-regression models, you're eating, you can eat up your degrees of freedom quite quickly, even though you may think, oh, I've got 1,000 effect sizes. So just something to keep in mind there, um, especially as you start to build the multivariate models. Okay. So that was kind of our just um, average effect size using the robust variance estimation. Um, and in your handout there um, on line 23 of the code, after you run the RobuMeta command, you can use the e-return list command to access, then if you forget what some of those scalars and matrices and macros, how they're stored, um, that's useful for programming. Okay, so now let's move on to the multivariate case where you want to look at these effect size moderators of the type of, the type of outcome, so whether it was an alcohol outcome or not, the time frame of the outcome, the gender composition of the sample, and whether the sample was referred from a prior level of care. So now you'll notice here in the syntax that after we specify our effect size variable, we now actually have six independent variables in our model. Okay, and so why is that? Remember, so for the variables that vary within and between studies, you now have to have a between, um, you have to have a measure for the between effect as well as the within effect. And so, remember we created those study level means with the M underscore, so those coefficients will now represent the between study effect of that variable. And then we created these group mean centered values of those variables, and so these are going to represent the within study effects of those covariates. Do we, are we following that? Okay. And then we've got our two variables that vary just b between studies, and so you can enter those as they are. So a couple things to point out here, so if you get your output. Um, so this is an example where I manipulated the data um, to where we can get opposite signs here. Um, so you can see here that the between effect, so the M, so the group mean, is actually a positive significant value indicating that across studies, those studies with alcohol use effect sizes are actually showing larger treatment effects, so bigger treatment effects. But actually the within study effect is negative. Um, and if you had a, you know, a liberal significance uh, you know, of 0.10, you might say that that was significant. Um, but it's a negative effect. Regardless of the significance, you're showing a negative effect so that within the studies that actually have variation on this outcome, uh, the alcohol effect sizes are actually smaller. Um, so this is kind of an interesting situation. So if you had neglected to do this centering and just entered the alcohol dummy variable by itself, you may have completely glossed over this and found no effect whatsoever because you would have had this muddled between, within, weird combination that really was meaningless. Um, so I think it's a good example for that. Now it's another thing is that if you actually went and looked back at the data said, 
okay, this is a little bit weird. Why are we finding the opposite effect? So there's a positive between study effect, but a negative within study effect. And so if you actually went back and looked at the data, you may have found, well, in this case, this is an instance where the studies that had variation on this variable were systematically different in some way than those that didn't vary on this. So perhaps the studies that had, you know, multiple types of outcomes, so alcohol, marijuana, and mixed drug use, maybe there was something different about those participants. Maybe there were really high risk samples of heroin users or something like that. And that may have been why you were finding these weird effects for alcohol. So again, these are not real data, so don't go run out and say that there, you know, is some really crazy finding with alcohol and adolescent treatment. But it's just to remember, it's to remind you to remember to think carefully about the covariates that you're entering into your model. And also to think when you get these results to then be very aware of your data and be very close with your data to try to understand why something like this might occur. Oh, I didn't highlight it. If you notice the degrees of freedom now are down to 32 because now we've estimated, you know, seven parameter or eight param seven parameter estimates. Um, the other variable that we had that varied within and between, we do have a significant negative effect for the um, time frame of the outcome. And actually, even though if, if you did the math on this, even though it's statistically significant, it's actually a very small substantively, um, it's small substantively, I think, so every um, month's increase in the outcome time frame is a 0.04 decrease in the effect size. So it's kind of a, I mean, that's just a reminder to always think about substantive significance as well as statistical. Um, and then both of the between variables, the percent male and the treatment referral, neither of those was significant in this instance. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, so the estimate of rho in the cor correlated effects case comes into the estimation at two places in the multiplier and in the estimate of tau squared. So the SATA program by default will take the conservative approach in the multiplier and use a rho value of one. Um, but again, kind of the recommendation that we're making is to take a sensitivity approach to how this affects your tau squared estimate and how it affects your results. Um, so you could conduct a sensitivity analysis running your meta-regression models with row values that vary from zero to one um, and see how that affects your tau squared estimates as well as your um, coefficients and standard errors. Um, so starting on line 26 of the output there, um, there's just a quick for loop that you can use. Um, that runs your regression models um, using values that range from 0 to 0.9 in increments of 0.1. So that's just kind of a quick way that you could do this to look at the, um, how that row value affects your findings. And so I won't go into this in detail, but if you kind of even just look at the extremes, changing the row value from 0.1 to 0.9, you know, only affects some of your results, you know, at the third decimal point. And so in this example, changing the having the different values of rho really has no statistical or substantive effect on your conclusions. So any questions about the correlated effects case? What did you do with, how did you weight the example? How did I weight the example? So the weights, they're built in here to where they're using um, the recommended weights that use a conservative estimate of the rho value. Um, so I think that was on, so it's, essentially one over the mean of the variance within a study times the number of effect sizes within that study. So each effect size gets that. But again, it's a conservative approach, so you're not giving more weight to the studies that have more effect sizes contributing. And so that's kind of the default there. You can input user weights there, but I'm not going to go into that because that's, you can decide that on your own. So, okay, so I want to quickly go through the hierarchical case. Um, we don't use this as much, um, but, you know, it's very obvious, especially in a lot of psych psychology fields, this would be um, of use. Um, so in the hierarchical case, remember, now you've got correlations in your thetas. Okay, so you may have research labs that are producing multiple studies. So you only have one effect size per study, but those studies are cl clustered at a higher level. Um, so let's say we were looking at the same literature of adolescent drug abuse treatment, um, but in this case we're thinking about the clustering at a hierarchical level, and so let's say we know that there are these 15 kind of research lab treatment facilities that are really producing all of the research in this literature, and we know that they're doing this, and so we've coded our effect sizes so that we know which studies belong to which research lab. 
Um, so you may have 68 effect sizes coming from 15 major research labs of the same study authors, kind of same uh, pools of participants, but they're different individuals within each of the studies. Um, so in this case, let's say we have a couple different moderators here. Um, so we might have an indicator for whether there was an alcohol use outcome again. Let's say we have an indicator for whether the outcome was self-reported versus a urinalysis screen or a parent report or a practitioner observation. Um, and then let's say we also have gender composition, age composition of the sample, and again our outcome time frame measure. Now in this case, so think about the clustering. So the clustering is now at the research lab level. All of these covariates of interest now vary both within and between labs, okay? Um, so now we've got this issue of centering that we have to deal with with all of these covariates. So before, that wasn't an issue with the gender composition of the sample. But now since we're talking about clusters of studies within research labs, each study, even though it's coming from the same cluster, probably is going to have a different gender composition because it's a different composition of participants. So in this example, we again have to take into account the variation within and between. Sorry, I didn't put it on my slides. Um, but it will be in the syntax. You use the same for loop there. Uh, now the only difference is that the clustering is going to be what we've defined as a study as a research lab. So here, if we estimated just our intercept only model, a few things, remember, so in the hierarchical case, we've now got a couple variance components you have to think about. So the tau squared now is representing the between research lab variance, and then the omega squared is representing the between study within research lab variance component. Um, and so if you forgot that you were doing this, um, there are a couple, oh, I guess I'm, the only thing that's different about the syntax in the hierarchical case is that you'll see in the weight type you specify hierarchical rather than random, which is what you did in the correlated effects case. And here you do not specify a value of rho because that's not needed in the hierarchical case. Okay? But in case you forgot what you were doing, <laughs> stay to remind you, you're using robust standard error estimation using the hierarchical weights. Um, and then you'll also notice here that in addition to the tau squared estimate, now you'll be getting this omega squared estimate, which is again that between study within lab variance component. Okay. So again, we're seeing overall positive, significant positive effects um, so across the studies and across the clusters. Um, so in this example, I guess I don't have to walk through this um, as much, but now you'll notice that because all the covariates in this hierarchical case varied within and between clusters, for each of those five covariates, we've now included um, the group cluster mean level of the variable as well as the cluster mean centered value of the variable. So that's to capture the within and between cluster effects of all of those covariates. Um, and so I won't actually walk through this output necessarily. I don't think that's very helpful. Um, but it's just to remind you to, you have to think very clearly about, okay, what model am I using? Is it the correlated effects case, the hierarchical case? And how do my variables and the covariates I want to put in my model, how do they vary? Okay. So in your handouts, I can walk through, I mean, we do have a little bit more time, so I don't know if there are SPSS users or R users who would like me to walk through these. I can just do kind of a brief thing. If you um, keep going through your output, eventually you will see I've included the help file for the SPSS macro. Um, and so this SPSS macro is available on the, our website at the Peabody Research Institute. And I've included a link at the end of this uh, slide deck. Um, this slide deck will be available on the conference website um, and the Campbell Collaboration website. Um, so if you go to the Peabody Research Institute um, methods links, you can access this SPSS macro and download it. Um, let me just state that this is still kind of in development, so if any of you start using it, which we would love, um, please email me feedback so we can incorporate that into this. Um, so I'm not necessarily an SPSS user, so I'm not sure what's user friendly and what's not. So if you tell us and you, we can update this to make it do what you need it to do, because really this is for people to start using this method. We want to make it easily accessible. Um, 
So here is the help file. The one thing that I should notice is just in my very rudimentary beta testing with SPSS, the way that we've got this macro set up is that when you run this macro, just like you would Dave Wilson's uh, MetaReg and MetaF macros if you're using those, um, as soon as you run or include this macro, it should print out your help file. I have noticed that for some reason my SPSS does not do that, and so I actually have to go in and change my options to include syntax. So I'm not sure. So you, if you don't see this print out, that may be why. Um, but we tried to set the SPSS macro up. Yes. Mm. and you run this, it will exclude that case from your data. And then if you happen to save your data set, you just lost that case. So you have to be careful when you run it with missing data um, that um, that's a little burden. Well, I would say that's something we should work on. <laughs> <laughs> we never want to lose data. Um, so, yes. So. Remind me about that because that is a big, a big issue. We've tried to format this macro very similarly to the MetaReg, Dave Wilson's MetaReg macro. So if you're using that, the syntax should be very similar. Um, a couple of options that we put in there, um, we did include a residual option so it can automatically save the residuals from your meta regression files, which we find very useful. Um, we've also included a, I think we've got, Actually, I think the default is that it will automatically print out a sensitivity analysis of your tau squared estimate and how it changes from zero to one. So I think it automatically will print that out um, for you. And so those are kind of the handy options that we've included in that. But again, please start using it, give us feedback. We would welcome that. Um, the last section of your handout includes the exact same exam two examples using an R function written by um, Beth and her colleagues that's included in the original um, paper and research synthesis methods. Um, so it's using this data, but essentially this is not a macro, but it's actually a function. So you have to run the function and then input your data to use the function. Um, so again, okay. Yes. Um, so currently we do not have a SAS macro. So based on my survey, there are actually a few people who do use SAS. Um, so, you know, if we've got SAS programmers in the room who would be interested in working on that, let us know um, if you want to use it. Um, so I think it might be on the horizon, but unless somebody pushes us, maybe it won't get to the horizon, it won't be to the forefront. Um, so definitely let us know as we uh, develop these tools because the goal really is to have people in the Campbell collaboration and people doing systematic reviews and meta-analyses to really start using these new methods um, because, you, you know, we're throwing all of these data away when now we can use them in a pretty easy and I think straightforward manner. Um, so just to wrap up quickly, some main conclusions that we'd like you to take away from this. Um, first, think about the proper model for the data and the dependencies in your data. So do you have dependencies in your epsilons and, or your thetas or both? And do you need the correlated effects model case or the hierarchical case? So think carefully about where these dependencies are arising. Um, the second main conclusion, so think very carefully about the covariates that you want to include in your meta regression models, especially if they're varying within and between clusters, I shouldn't say studies, but between clusters, you really need to think carefully about this issue of centering. Um, and then the issue of efficient weights, um, so in the correlated effects model, you know, we have to think about rho and what that means, and so if you've got prior information on rho, definitely use that. Um, or if you've got binary proportions, you can use some information from that to get the upper bounds on rho. Um, but if you don't have information on rho, and usually you probably won't, um, you know, we're recommending the sensitivity approach where you're looking at how your effects are changing at different values of tau squared for different values on your tau squared. But then the software, we do have it currently set up uh, at the conservative approach um, for rho equals one in the weight calculations. 
Um, so here are the websites, and again, we'll have these uh, slides posted online, uh, but definitely we appreciate any feedback that you have um, as we further develop these. Um, so I guess it's the last session of the day. Thank you for sticking it out in, in the afternoon in this kind of tough topic, and on behalf of the Campbell Collaboration Methods Group, we really appreciate you all coming out. So I know you're probably all eager to go, but if you have questions or you want to come up, or you think... We'll keep you posted. Okay.